Hello and welcome to another episode of Twimble Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. If you love this podcast, you definitely don't want to miss the very first TwimmelCon, which is coming up soon. The two-day conference will focus on topics like overcoming the barriers to getting machine and deep learning models into production, how to apply MLOps and DevOps to the machine learning workflow in your company, the latest approaches to platform technologies for accelerating and scaling machine learning and deep learning, experiences and lesson learns in delivering platforms and infrastructure support for data management, experiment management, and model deployment. Platform deployment stories from leading companies like Facebook, Google, Airbnb, and more, and organizational and cultural best practices for success. Be sure to register today at twimmelcon.com. If you've got a great story to tell in this area, there's still time to submit a proposal for our call for presenters, which has been extended until July 19th. Accepted talks will be notified no later than August 15th. Head over to twimmelcon.com slash CFP to submit your presentation. Looking forward to seeing you there. All right, everyone, I am here with Michael Levin. Michael is a professor of biology and director of the Allen Discovery Center at Tufts University. Michael, welcome to This Week in Machine Learning and AI. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. Uh, so you gave a talk just this afternoon to uh, a gigantic room here at the NeurIPS conference. Your talk was on a couple of themes that I found uh, fascinating uh, just from the summary of it, developmental bioelectricity yes. and some of the implications for uh, machine learning. Why don't we have you get started by telling us a little bit about your background and then we'll dive into the topic of your talk. Sure. Um, my background originally was computer science. I did software engineering for a number of years. I got an undergrad uh, degree in computer science. Uh, I then went to uh, graduate school uh, for biology, so I have a PhD in genetics. Um, and then I did a postdoctoral training in cell biology, and uh, my lab does a number of things in developmental biology and regenerative biology and computer science, all around the theme of information processing and computation in living systems. So we are interested in how living biological systems uh, process information and compute at all scales, molecular, tissue level, cell level, behavioral, and so on. Maybe you can give us a kind of a broad survey of what the current thinking is around biological computation. It's not something that I've had a lot of exposure to. No, and this is very much an emerging field. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, there are lots of uh, divergent uh, opinions and approaches at this point in this area. It's a very exciting time. Uh, my particular area comes in in trying to understand how cells and tissues interact to revise the anatomical plan of the body. So we all start life as a single cell. The fertilized egg gives rise to a bunch of early embryonic uh, cells, and these have to arrange themselves into a particular anatomical structure. So it might be a tree or a snake or an elephant or a human or whatever. But all of these cells have to figure out what to do to make this appropriate structure. And in fact, it's much more than simply creating that structure. Some animals are highly regenerative, which means that you can uh, for example, if uh, certain body parts are amputated, they will regrow those parts. So salamanders will regrow uh, legs and, uh, and um, eyes and jaws and portions of the brain. And these kind of examples and many others that I show today uh, illustrate a remarkable capability of biological systems to do flexible dynamic remodeling. That is, they don't simply uh, create a structure as some sort of a pre um, pre, uh, pre-written uh, set of instructions, but they can modify on the fly to repair towards a particular goal state, a, a coherent organism. So when a salamander regenerates its limb, for example, it stops exactly when the limb reaches its correct size and shape. And so the question then for regenerative medicine is not only to uh, try to trigger this kind of regenerative ability, and we certainly work on this in our lab is to try to kickstart regeneration in human patients uh, down the line, but uh, also to understand how the whole system knows when to stop. And for us, uh, regeneration is primarily 
a, uh, a computational problem. The, the, the tissues need to know that they've been damaged. They need to know what to do to repair and they need to know when it's done. And these are all questions that uh, really are very much not understood today. Mm. It, this is kind of blowing my mind. I think uh, for those of us outside of the field of biology, like we, we know that bodies do these things and you know, the answer is just, oh, it's DNA, right? DNA controls all of this, yeah. all this stuff. But to think of it as a computational process, that's a totally new way of thinking about it for me. Yeah, so so this is this is very common, um, and in fact, uh, so so I gave a version of this talk to a bunch of middle school kids last year, and I asked them, I, I showed them a picture of an egg, and I asked them what what actually determines what comes out of this egg. It could be a snake, a turtle, a, a dinosaur, whatever, and and even the nine year olds all said DNA. It's DNA. Uh -huh. Well. In a certain sense, it is DNA, but in, the, the thing to realize is that if, if in this, the age of uh, genomics, if you actually sequence the genome, you understand the genome says, uh, has, has information about proteins. There is right. nothing directly that you could read out of a genome that would tell you how many uh, limbs the creature was going to have or what uh, type of uh, body symmetry it was going to have, whether it was going to be regenerative or not, or uh, any of these other things. There, none of this is directly encoded in the DNA. What you see in, in the DNA is just the proteins. How do so, we know? Like, have we cracked the code to, I mean, we know we can sequence the genome and know the, the protein sequence, but how do we know that that isn't somehow encoding, you know, some of these more discrete properties? Well, we, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a subtle thing. So, so what the DNA, I'll, I'll jump right into the kind of the middle of the talk. So, 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 <laughs> so what, I did, what I did at the beginning of the talk was to try to set up a couple of uh, things that may be surprising to people. So one is this amazing ability of bodies to repair themselves. I showed, one, for example, this um, creature known as the planarian flatworm. And these flatworms are able to regenerate any part of their body. So they can be chopped into pieces. Every piece knows what a complete planarian looks like. It regrows exactly what's necessary, no more, no less. Mm -hmm. I also showed unicellular organisms that have one cell that are just, no, no brain, just one cell, but that are incredibly adept at behavior, at um, uh, changing their body, changing their structure in order to um, fit their environment and so on. So, so I tried to get across the importance of understanding this kind of uh, decision making in biological tissues. Now, the, the DNA code has been cracked. We know, we know exactly what the DNA actually encodes. The DNA actually encodes proteins. Now, down the line, of course, in an important sense, the DNA produces everything you need for the hardware of the body. So the proteins that are in the genome, that's what your body is going to be made of. Okay, so, so hardware is critical. Without hardware, you get nothing. Mm -hmm. However, hardware is only half the story. So the hardware that uh, is produced by the DNA, some of these proteins are electrical um, uh, uh, conduits known as ion channels. And the thing about these ion channels is they can operate as little transistors. They can, some of them are voltage-gated current conductances, just like transistors. Hmm. And this means that the hardware produced by that genome is electrically active. And it's not only electrically active, but the circuits that are present in these cells produce some very complex behaviors that allow symmetry breaking, self-organization, and decision-making in terms of pattern control at the large scale, so whole tissues, whole organs, whole uh, appendages of bodies. So, so yes, the DNA is critical in that it establishes the hardware, but the software that runs on this hardware is not directly um, encoded anywhere in the DNA. It is the result of the electrical activity. Another way- So the DNA establishes the hardware, which creates the software that controls all these things, essentially? There, there's, a, there's a default software that will run on this hardware if it's unperturbed. But okay. the cool thing about the software is that it's very, um, it's very plastic and it's written and, and, and it operates in such a way that it's, it makes it very easy for us to rewrite it. And so that means that we can intervene. And I showed numerous examples of, of uh, us learning to intervene in the software to make the, to make the body into shapes that are entirely not what the genome default is. So, um, uh, for are we talking about things like CRISPR or not at all? More? No. So, okay. so no genomic editing. Not genomic whatsoever. editing. No, not, not whatsoever. So, so the interesting thing about this approach, what makes it different, is that uh, another point I tried to make in the talk is that computer science. The reason the reason computer science was able to drive this incredible um, revolution in information technology is that we moved from having to program at the level of hardware, which is where we were in the 40s. You know, if you wanted mm -hmm. to program a computer, you had to get in there and shift wires around. Right. That was how we programmed. But now, um, because of the appreciation of the hardware-software distinction, we are able to work at these, uh, in these high-level um, uh, programming uh, formalisms where you can think about the information flow, the algorithm, okay. and you're not worried about what the underlying hardware is. Because if the hardware is good enough, 
it can run lots of different kinds of software. And at that point, you can forget about the hardware and really okay. focus on the algorithm. Our biological hardware is good enough. It is, it is complex enough that it is able to run all sorts of interesting physiological software. There is some default that comes with, if you don't touch it, this is what it's going to do. Mm -hmm. But it is also um, a label such that we can rewrite it. And so what I've shown is rewriting the software without touching the hardware, meaning control what happens by input and experience rather than by changing the circuitry. The, there are two analogies that I will put forward. One is, at this point, we program, the we program our computers not by getting in there and, and melting bits of silicon here and there, but we have a keyboard. We have a way of entering information, not, re not rewiring the, the physical hardware. Mm -hmm. And so everybody understands that the same piece of hardware, if it's, if it's decent, can run lots of different types of software. And the way you change it is by providing inputs that shift the electrical dynamics of the system without having to change the structure of it. Mm -hmm. The other analogy is with the brain. So... The DNA certainly includes all of the proteins, instructions for all of the proteins that are required to make up your brain. But the information content of your brain is nowhere in the genome. And mm -hmm. you couldn't dream of uh, reading out the content of a person's memories and, and their mind or, or in animals by looking at the genome. What you may recover from the genome is some default instinctual behavior. So for example, um, let's say some insects, wasps, you know, they're born knowing how to build a, a, a you know, a, a thing to catch prey and all this. Mm -hmm. So. Um, the genome certainly gives rise to a neural network whose default behavior includes these kinds of interesting things that, that insects do. But other animals are also able to learn. And this means that you can have um, experiential inputs, information that they get through the visual, through other senses, that radically change what their behavior is going to be down the line. Many circuits in the body have this kind of interesting plastic property. So some of the things that I've shown today, for example, one of the, one of the examples was we can take a flatworm that has a very particular shaped head mm -hmm. and we can um, very transiently, briefly alter the electrical properties of that, uh, of that animal uh, such that when it regenerates a new head, it will make heads appropriate to other species of flatworms. Other mm -hmm. species 150 million years different. So the shape of the head is different, the shape of the brain is different, the stem cell distribution is appropriate to a completely different animal 150 million years distant. The genome is untouched. There's wow. we, we did not touch the genomic sequence because what the genomic sequence encodes is a body that can build a number of different types of structures. One of those structures is this other type of planarian head. Um, I've shown other examples where we can uh, um, induce uh, different uh, parts of the body. So for example, we can make a, a chunk of the gut of a frog embryo become an eye. And again, hmm. this, is, uh, this is the same thing because uh, one of the things these electrical, as it turns out, one of the things these electrical networks do is they specify large-scale anatomical um, uh, uh, decisions for the body. And so the decision of what organ shall I make at any given space, uh, in the, uh, any given location in the body, is dictated by the outcome of a complex electrical circuit. Downstream of that electrical circuit are all the familiar things uh, people have heard about. So transcriptional cascades, genes turning on and off, physical forces, tension, stresses between cells, cells moving around, uh, chromatin states, um, uh, so, so all, all of these kinds of things. Uh, but many of these important decisions are made upstream by an electrical circuit, and we have the opportunity to intervene. And uh, I've shown, I showed a number of examples of this where we can uh, repair things that, for example, um, animals in which uh, defects have been induced in genes that uh, are required for brain development, for example. So we showed a, 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 a bioelectrical fix, which uh, is a strategy that repairs their brain. So basically, um, by forcing the appropriate electrical states in that region of the body, they will build a correct brain with a correct structure, correct function, and even correct behavior. So these animals get their IQs back, despite the fact that they've had a genetic mutation that normally takes out the brain completely, or uh, that they've been um, exposed to a variety of uh, horrible teratogens that normally cause really terrible defects. So there's the genome, there's the default set of things that happen normally, but that layer is very rich and we get to intervene and make a number of changes. This is incredible. This kind of suggests that at least at some point, you know, there's a possibility of bioelectric medicine. Oh, do yes. we have any, you know, for humans, do we have any, you know, early indications of that being possible? Yeah, very much so. Um, so, so we're working exactly on this. We're working on uh, applications like limb regeneration, tumor reprogramming, uh, repair of birth defects, all of these things. 
I think are uh, going to be part of human medicine. And one of the um, important things is that something like 20% of all drugs are ion channels, blockers or activators. So mm -hmm. this means that there's a huge uh, so tool. So we kind of already are starting to do this. Well, not so, so they're all used for things like cardiac arrhythmias, epilepsy, so, mm -hmm. so people use them to target neurons. But okay. my big message today was that uh, Neurons are um, simply a sped up, uh, uh, sort of accelerated version of much more primitive ancient cells. So cells were, 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 were processing information in networks long before brains and neurons came on the scene. Hmm. And while all of these drugs right now are being, uh, are being developed for uh, uh, problems in, uh, in, in cardiac and neural, uh, and neural kinds of uh, syndromes, they form this amazing toolkit of electroceuticals that we've begun to uh, uh, apply them towards problems in tumor reprogramming, um, regenerative induction repair, and so on. And so I, I absolutely think this is going to be part of human medicine, yeah. Uh, one of the things that you were talking about in your talk was uh, this notion of write, rewriting pattern memories. Is yes. that uh, you know this general concept that we've been discussing, or is there is there a more specific meaning to that? Well, I can give you a, some, a specific example, but it's part of that same that same idea. One of the things that um, we 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 know is that even our unicellular ancestors, so single cells before they became multicellular, already had a lot of the machinery that we associate with decision-making and cognition. So synaptic proteins, ion channels, um, neurotransmitters, these things are extremely ancient. Mm -hmm. And cells and tissues were processing this information before we had brains. Uh, this is... Um, the, the, the way that they, that they do this is by storing uh, bioelectric pre-patterns that are um, guideposts for what they're going to do if they're damaged. So we, I show today an example where we can take a flatworm and in an intact flatworm, you can actually see, we've developed techniques to visualize some of these electrical memories. We can see the, these as stable electrical states in tissues. And we can go in and rewrite them. And when we rewrite them, what happens is initially nothing because that, that memory is latent, it's not being used. But if that animal gets injured in the future, so let's say we cut its head and its tail off, that middle fragment with a rewritten pattern memory will then go on to uh, regenerate two heads, one at each end. So no tail, two heads at each end. And this is because we gave it a false memory. We gave it a false. Now, this is a different kind of memory. It's not the kind of memory that lives in the brain about behavior. This is a memory that's distributed across the whole body that determines the behavior of the cells as they will try to recreate what they think a worm looks like. And this representation of the fact that a worm is supposed to have one head and one tail is not set in stone. We can rewrite it. And that's what we've done. Mm -hmm. It also calls to mind the whole idea of... Uh uh, biological memory systems, like the you know the human brain, from a kind of storage perspective, is a way more efficient uh, memory store than DRAM, you know, that we use in computers. Is are, are there clear implications to that? Yes, I, absolutely. So, so there are there are a number of uh, applications of this work to machine learning and to AI in general. Uh, certainly, living tissue is an incredibly dense information medium. There are um, networks made of cells within with inside of each cell. Uh, there are incredibly complex molecular and also uh, sub subcellular networks, things like the cytoskeleton, which process information in a distributed fashion in an incredibly dense and rich uh, way. So, so I think as as new media, as new excitable, me unconventional media for computation, uh, biological tissues have a lot to teach us. I think that's that's absolutely true. The other, the, some of the other implications are that biological systems are very very good at adaptively uh, altering their behavior and function in light of novel stressors. So the, 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 the problem that we, or a problem that we currently have in machine learning where uh, some of these applications are really brittle. They're very good at doing one thing. You shift them to a slightly different problem and everything falls apart. Mm -hmm. Living things are the exact opposite of that. We have many examples of living structures that can um, adaptively respond to novel stressors in, uh, in a very uh, kind of, um, efficient way, and, and this is something that we badly need in, in robotics and machine learning. And I think we're gonna be able to get that by observing how cells and tissues make decisions in the kinds of experiments that we deal with. Mm. A lot of the mechanisms of machine learning are you know, the manipulation of probability distributions. Uh, do these kinds of bioelectric systems and signals within, uh, within the body or other organisms, do they exhibit the same kind, same kind of probabilistic 
uh, nature? They, they do, they do. So, so we've we've uh, we've characterized several kinds of stochastic uh, decision making. But pretty much, um, we we have a we have a, an, an interesting review on this on this whole question. Pretty much. Uh, Every major concept in um, neuroscience and cognitive science that we've been able to find has an analog in uh, somatic decision making. So everything you can think of from, from memories to, to optical illusions, to false memories, to forgetting, to inference, to uh, making mistakes, uh, to calculating uh, forward um, for expectations in terms of anticipation, all of these concepts and, and many more um, have exact analogs outside the body. And I think one of the, outside the brain rather. And I think one of the major implications of all this is that in developing new AI and machine learning technologies, we should not be trying to mimic the human brain. I think that um, a focus on architectures that uh, try to mimic uh, specific uh, regions of the brain or specific processes in the brain or, or specific um, architectures are really looking at one very narrow and, and fairly recent evolutionary development, the, the kinds of things that we really want, which is robust, distributed, um, highly plastic, uh, performance and decision making, these were things that were invented long before brains came on the scene. And uh, th those basic mechanisms still remain to be um, investigated and implemented in, um, in machine learning. Mm. Are there any um, kind of concrete examples of the intersection of machine learning and developmental bioelectricity to date? Or are you projecting in, into the future into a direction we need to go? There's two, I would think there's two branches of this. On the one hand, uh, it's the question of what can machine learning do for regenerative medicine? And we have uh, begun to um, develop, and, and we need a lot more help with this and a lot more progress uh, is, is available. This is, a, this is a hugely exciting frontier area of using machine learning technology and, and strategies to help developmental biologists solve the problem of uh, growth of, of pattern control. What, we, what, what biologists are very, very good at is uh, characterizing the molecular details of the hardware. We are um, basically where computer science was in the 40s. All we do is try to inter interface with the hardware. We try to push uh, pu push around single molecules. You know, all the, the, the fanciest papers in nature are all about how somebody can do something at single molecule resolution. This is what we're very good at. What we're terrible at is solving the inverse problem of asking, what do we need to tweak at the low level to get a desired systems level outcome? So if somebody's, if, if we have a fetus that's going to have uh, three fingers instead of five, the question of what exactly uh, do we need to tweak at the lowest level to get a particular outcome or uh, to fix a certain organ or the shape of the face or something like this, mm -hmm. we're actually um, really, uh, re really bad at that. And so Using meanwhile the data on these low-level pathways grows exponentially. So so people keep sequencing things. Um, the 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 this this kind of deep data is just increasing in, in an incredible fashion. But but this has already uh, exceeded the human ability to synthesize all of these data into some sort of uh, model that can be that can be reversed so that we can ask what would we have to do to get a particular anatomical outcome? So machine learning tools to help us with this problem are absolutely essential for regenerative medicine to move forward. It, and, and we've had a little bit of success with this. We've developed some, uh, some, some genetic algorithm-based um, machine learning platforms that have actually helped us discover models of how some of these things work. It's, it's kind of amazing. We, we made what I think is the first, this was a couple of years ago, um, what I think is the first example of a, uh, a model in developmental biology that was discovered by a non-human intelligence. So basically we have a platform that was able to uh, derive a model, not just crunch the numbers, but actually come up with a theory of what was going on, what was going on inside that planarian flatworm that was better able to explain all the experiments than existing models that humans have come up with. So I think this is the tip of the iceberg. We have to do, um, do better with this and give people tools to um, help extract wisdom from this mountain of data that we have. Going in the opposite direction, this is really just starting and I don't have anything specific to point to other than people have started to look at things like slime molds, like ant colonies, like bacterial biofilms as models for uh, computation. And there are people like Andrew Radomatsky and, and others who are using some of these kinds of unconventional media as uh, very simple computers with the idea of understanding uh, how they do what they do and trying to um, 
implement some of these advantages in robotics. And, and, and we're doing this too. We have collaborations with people like Josh Bongard at University of Vermont who make robots and uh, trying to really uh, squeeze some, um, some insights out of these biological systems for much better technology. Mm. Uh, really fascinating work, Michael. Thanks so much for taking the time to share with us. Any kind of final thoughts or suggestions for folks that want to dig into this in uh, a little bit more detail? Yeah, the biggest thing uh, I can I can suggest is to uh, drop me an email because we are always very interested in uh, collaborating with people from the machine learning community. I think there are huge opportunities in both directions uh, for enriching um, uh, the, the progress. And so um, you can reach me at michael.levin at tufts.edu. And if you drop me an email, um, I will get back to you and uh, you can see all of, the, uh, all of the data we have. There's lots of code that we've written and I would love to uh, talk to experts in this field for working together. Fantastic, thanks so much, Michael. Thank you very much. All right, everyone, that's our show for today. For more information on today's show, visit twimmelai.com slash shows. Be sure to get those submissions in for the TwimbleCon CFP at twimblecon.com slash CFP. As always, thanks so much for listening and catch you next time.